Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here with you. Uh, have you been to Slush before? Oh, first time. First time? You gave I've, a keynote I've, last I've had a pleasure last year. OK. For me, it's also the first time, and it's an amazing conference, probably the best startup conference I've been to. So really great to be here. Um, maybe before we sort of go into content and topics, like you have very different founder stories in terms of the, the background and how you got to, to founding your company. So can you tell us a little bit about like how you started your company, why you did it, what was the way there? Yeah, so I've been working in space for uh, uh, more than 10 years. I was working at Airbus, Ariane Airbus, Group. Uh, the last program I led at Airbus was the European Service Module, so second biggest space program in Europe. Uh, and we were building half of the Orion vehicle, which is bringing back humanity to the moon. And while working on, our, on the Orion, on the one hand, it's amazing because, as I was saying, you bring back humanity to the moon. On the other hand, it's very frustrating because that capsule cannot be reused, cannot be refueled, and you see the trend that every space vehicle can be rockets, can be capsule, will be as our cars, our ships, reusable, and will have the capacity to be refueled. So it's kind of you spend days and nights on something that you know in 10 years will become obsolete. So we said with two other people of the team, well, we know how to build capsule. Let's get out and let's make something which is really meaningful that will give to Europe its own capacity to go to space stations around the Earth, around the Moon, which is today a 5 billion market but will become a 50 billion market. And uh, we can be number one in Europe and we can be the challenger of SpaceX. And so we did it two years ago. We are the first in the world to privately fund such a business. The first in the world also to fly with a green propulsion system. And today we have raised, uh, so after a bit more than two years, 65 million USD. And we've won around about 200 million USD contract. So, and we fly our first capsule in uh, February or March next year. Wow, very cool. Daniel? Yeah, we actually founded ESAR straight out of university. And we were building sounding rockets and rocket engines there. And we competed also at the same time in a Hyperloop challenge uh, that was organized by Elon Musk. And after actually winning all of the four competitions that SpaceX arranged, uh, they said, you know, can we hire those people? And if you're a US rocket company, it's actually super hard to hire non-US citizens. And so we, we spoke to those SpaceX VPs and figured, you know, why don't we build our own company? And Elon wanted to hire us for Tesla, but we said, we really don't want to build electric cars. And so we just happened to, to build a European rocket company. And so we started five years ago. We've uh, built a fully vertically integrated company. Um, so really building from design, manufacturing, testing, and then the actual launch operations of the rocket. And we're targeting our first launch in a couple months from now. Um, so literally full rocket is in the midst of assembly right now. Uh, so it's super exciting times. Yeah, I mean, we have our fingers crossed because we've been invested with you guys for, I think, three years now. And of course, like super exciting times now. Yeah. So I mean, maybe going a step back, I mean, I've been like watching and reading sci-fi um, all my life. So I'm very excited about space. But like in general, why is space important? Like what's, what's in it for, for humanity? And Helen? I, I think space will pretty much disrupt any other industry whether it is the insurance business, whether it's providing connectivity to half of the world's population who literally does not have internet access today. Um, it is about, for example, autonomous driving. All those different business models within different industries will just get disrupted through seamless connectivity and through Earth's observation that you can literally track on a global scale from day one, because space kind of by definition is global. Um, and so a satellite on a low Earth orbit uh, flies around the planet every one and a half hours. So every one and a half hours, you basically get to overfly the full planet. And it is amazing to see that what kind of was reserved mostly for governments 10, 15 years ago, today is very much driven by private companies, by private industries, um, fueled also by venture capital. And just the cost of actually bringing something to space uh, and operating in space has been decreasing dramatically. So now you literally have companies like uh, Helen uh, building their own space program, basically, that before only governments would have built. Uh, now Helen is building just with her company and a fairly small team compared to what governments used to do. 
perhaps to, to complement. Uh, I think space will have and uh, is having actually a huge impact on humanity in the future in three main areas. Uh, one is environment. I mean, you mentioned the observation satellites, so all the data we can have, uh, you know, from space observation. It's super useful to understand the climate change. It's also very useful to optimize our activities. Uh, just as an example, OneSelp in India is now serving millions of farmers to optimize the way they use water and fertilizers. So it's very concrete impact how to optimize our activities. This is true for agriculture, this is true for logistics. So understanding the climate and optimizing our activities. This is for environment. The second part is communication. Uh, I believe, I may be wrong, perhaps we need to have a meeting in 10 years from now, but I believe in 10, 15 years, 50% 50 of our broadband will come from space. Wow. Because if you think about it, the cost of deployment, so deploying a broadband constellation, especially with launch or costs going down, it's a few billions. And if you think about when we move from 4G to 5G, it was also a few billions per country in Europe. But with a whole constellation, you cover the world. And with the next generation of launchers like, like Starship, so very, very big launcher, the price per kilogram could go down to around about $500, potentially $100. So we'll come at a time when it's just cheaper to um, not only to operate, but like to repair and to upgrade constellations in space than it is on the ground. There are still some capacity problems, but I think this will be solved. And uh, so I think that's going to disrupt the whole telecommunication industry. And the third point is, this is more human, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll extend, I think, our capacity to live and act in space. Uh, so we'll do probably wonderful things. We'll do probably horrible things. <laughs> so what we see now in, in action in space is more and more civil space stations, more and more also in the future military station, and uh, the necessity from a strategic point of view to master these new areas uh, to use the moon as a potentially tank station uh, because there are lots of water on the moon that can be used for uh, refueling vessels. And if you think about it, you use three times as energy to fly to the moon and come back as to go back on Earth, fuel your vehicle, and then come back again. So now there is a race to master water at lunar surface as there was in the past the race to oil and in the past the race to gold. And I think what is critical is that if we look at the 16th century, we had a technical turning point, which is we knew, suddenly we knew how to build big ships that would cross the ocean, and then we explored. And we're exactly, I think, at the same time, we have this technical turning point, we know how to build launchers that will be reusable, we know how to build ships that will be reusable, can be refueled. So we are at this point when we have the capacity to start traveling in space in a completely different manner. And then as humans, we explore, it will not take 10 years. It didn't take 10 years in the 16th century. It will take perhaps one century. But we are at the beginning of this new era. And so we don't know exactly what it will bring, but I think it will be transformational, as it has been transformational to discover what we were calling the new world in the 16th century. Fascinating. So, so Daniel, you, you mentioned that like in the past, um, it has mainly been governments that, that funded uh, and operated space programs, and then over the last, I don't know, 10, 10 years, like there's a lot of private companies, guys like you starting, starting companies, venture capital money. Well, what was the trigger here? Was it just like Elon Musk uh, having the guts to do it and then others following? Or was there anything other that's driving that? I think there's probably a few different elements which came together. Um, a, a few bold investors who said, yes, I will actually put money into a space company. And that actually just happened basically throughout the last five, six, seven years. When we raised our seed round in 2018, people would just ask us, what did you guys smoke? Oh, you're completely <laughs> crazy. Um, secondly, technology became available. Um, and actually, a lot of universities built a lot of technology, for example. And then instead of those people and researchers actually going into the big corporates, like the Airbuses and the Boeings and whatnot, um, they actually decided, you know, I could actually also build my own satellite and finance it with a couple tens of millions of, of dollars from the, from the VCs. And to a point now already where you can literally order satellite online. 
You just go on a website, you click all of the components, put them into a shopping cart, you literally buy a complete satellite online. And that's just something that just five or 10 years ago was not available. So the barriers of entry actually into the space industry have been dropping massively, such that we know a lot of companies which have nothing to do with space per se, try to look into how can I use space to actually disrupt my own industry and get a competitive advantage over my competition. So we see, for example, all of the automotive companies looking massively at how can I provide connectivity so I can do autonomous driving. And once autonomous driving is there, how can I actually entertain all of the people? And it's not that you basically all have seamless connectivity through 5G networks. So basically, again, here, the nice advantage that space provides is it is global. And for example, a car company would not have to deal with all the, satellite, uh, the, the telecom operators in 100 different countries, basically. Yeah. Um, so again, they use it kind of really to disrupt their own business. And I think a lot of people just also got comfortable with the fact that space is not just up for governments and maybe defense ministries, but it's actually a very commercially driven industry. And so if you take a look actually at the numbers, 90% of all the satellites that were launched last year have been commercial satellites. And I think it's, uh, as Helen said, I think we're just at the, at the beginning of uh, what will grow even further. Um, but ultimately, it's a mix of people, capital availability, and tech availability. And let's talk about Europe versus US for, for a second. Um, I mean, I think like a big driver is, um, for, for, for you guys at least, I, I know, is that we want to have a launch capacity in Europe, uh, actually. But are we just playing catch up with the US, or is there sort of areas where we are actually leading, where we can really beat, beat the US? So perhaps we can speak today and then uh, in the future. Uh, today, there are some specific areas where we are excellent. Earth observation, for example, we are one of the best in the world. Telecommunication, we were. I think now with Starlink, probably we will not be. Uh, launcher, I mean, SpaceX uh, disrupts completely the launcher business, and I'm super happy to see companies like Isar embracing the challenge and hopefully building the next uh, European launcher that will be able to compete. Uh, so launcher, we have a problem right now. And capsule, so my business, we had nothing in Europe. Um, in the future, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic, actually, uh, because if we look back in history, uh, let's take this, the example of Airbus. When we started Airbus in Europe, it was a crazy project, because Boeing was far much advanced than yeah. the technology we had in Europe. And we had two steps. The first step was a catch-up. And in certain areas, like reusable launchers, we need to master this technology point. We have to catch up. It will take five, six years, whatever. Um, capsule, we need to master the technology, same, we need to catch up. So that's kind of phase one. And then there is phase two. Phase two is when Airbus said, okay, I'm bringing on the market the A320, which was a revolution. And I think we need to be a bit bolder in Europe and think, okay, what is the concept that's going to beat Starship or what will be Starship in 10, 15 years? So in terms of transportation. And what are the key technologies that we need to master and work on right now? Because there is a catch-up, but with a different concept than Starship. And I'm sure you have some ideas, and I also have some ideas. Probably we can come with the equivalent of A320 and then disrupt again. So there is this catching up, but also this boldness in thinking that we need to reinstigate uh, in the European Space Agency and also in the investors, if I may say so to, like the Americans, have a portfolio management where they can be companies who have super high risk, super high rewards, and then there are companies which are more like in the stream. Yeah. I think there's also one fundamental topic that Europe inherently is better than pretty much anyone in the world, and that is manufacturing. So I'll tell you why it's important. Up until a few years ago, companies and governments were building individual satellites. So it's literally a single satellite that would go around the planet. The challenge with that is, well, once the satellite passed over you, you'll have to wait a couple of days until it come back to the same position. So people came up 
with satellite constellations where they would just have so many satellites in space that at any point in time, you always have a satellite above your head. And what it requires then is a manufacturing capability that you can actually not only build one or two satellites a year, but you have to build hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of satellites, and that's also, for example, rockets and capsules every year. And when we started off, Europe was literally building about five rockets a year. And when I take a look at our capabilities now, with probably about 100 times less employees, we can actually build 10 times more rockets. So there's an efficiency factor in terms of people of probably three orders of magnitude. And that's the part where Europe is really, really strong. It is the manufacturing capability and the automation in manufacturing. So we actually built a rocket engine every couple of days versus the established industry, which built orbital class rocket engines maybe every six months or so. And so the automation also that Europe inherently has from other industries like the automotive industry, we can basically apply in the space industry and really take a strong competitive advantage over anyone in the world, actually. And I sorry, yeah. just wanted to add perhaps uh, two points. The first is that there is a need for more competition. And we've seen that in the, at the expression company because we just signed a deal with the first private space station, Axiom. And uh, they didn't sign with Boeing, they didn't sign with Northrop Group Mine, they only signed with SpaceX and with us because they want players who are affordable and reliable. And the second point I wanted to mention is uh, we are now discussing contracts with India, with UAE, with Saudi. These countries, they want to be in between China and, and US. And here we have a unique card that we can play. Interesting. And uh, Daniel, you told me something really interesting about like, access to, to engineers globally backstage. Can you maybe repeat that for the audience? I found that really fascinating. Yeah, so it's a bit specific to building rockets. Um, the United States is, as of today, the only place in the world that actually operates private rockets. Also, rockets operated by private companies. Outside of the United States, it's basically only governments. Um, and when you're a US citizen, you're actually, you actually need a Department of Defense approval to work outside the United States on rockets, and vice versa. You barely can work as a non-US citizen in a US rocket company. So basically, the US market, kind of through their export control regulations, is kind of um, yeah, building their own market locally. Uh, but all of the other 200 countries uh, basically have to um, work outside the United States as well, because they're legally just not allowed to actually work in the US on rocketry. So for us, obviously, it's a great topic because we can hire people globally. Uh, we now have 400 people from 50 nationalities, and people come from all over the world because it's literally a place where they can actually work, and they're allowed to work on rockets. It's really interesting. Um, you mentioned Airbus, Airbus before, and like Airbus, obviously big European success story. I think one of the sort of critical factors was always that like every country in Europe wanted to have like a part of Airbus, and that led to a certain fragmentation. Is that an issue that we have in space as well? Yes, we have in space uh, in Europe. Uh, this was also true in the US. What we call zero return. So if you are Italy or Germany and um, you want to participate to the next uh, launch or program, for example, you give 100 million to European Space Agency, which takes 15% management fee, a bit more than a VC, <laughs> and, and then 85% nice 85, 85 comes back to the country. Um, now there is lots of debate, and I find it very good to change the rule, because of course, if you function like that, then you cannot choose your suppliers. And uh, so the first way to change is, of course, to get private funding, because then you are free to use that funding the way it comes. But still, the space is a mix between private business and public business, and uh, space agencies will, will stay a very important anchor client. So three ways to change the rule, which are currently being discussed. Uh, one is very simple. When, we, when agency acts as a service uh, provider, uh, as NASA did since already 2006, so they buy a service. Meaning a country can get its return, not only industrial return, but also service return. For example, I'm UK, I'm investing one million. I get nothing in my industry, but I get the right to use the launcher of Daniel, for example, or the capsule of Helen. 
that's a way to have more flexibility. The second way is to do that with more flexibility inside the European Space Agency. I don't want to enter into technical details. And the third way, uh, which is actually uh, revolutionary, is to say we do that ex post. So let's imagine you bid for the next European launcher. Then you do the fundraising and not European Space Agency. So you go to Germany, to France, and say, OK, you choose your suppliers, and that's my consortium. And you bid with the letter of intent of the countries, saying, if Daniel wins, then we will be the anchor client, and we will invest, I don't know, 50% of the development cost in the launcher of Daniel. So these three options are currently being discussed. And hopefully, by 25, uh, we'll see some reforms being applied. And that's, that's an absolute necessity to unleash the competitiveness of the European industry. It's also not that governments are super quick always. <laughs> so we would love governments, obviously, to be faster. Um, but I think they've seen also in some of the other countries, like the US specifically, um, that you can actually even run a lot of nationally critical and sovereign technology based on a multitude of suppliers from the industry. You don't have to build it as a government yourself. And that's kind of the one thing that Europe starts to realize, like, oh, we actually have to not build rocket ourselves because they're going to be expensive and over time and whatnot. Um, we can actually just procure the services from the industry. And it's the same for rockets as well as for satellites, as well as for research in space. Um, so we're seeing quite a bit of change currently undergoing, also from an institutional and a, and a government perspective, which is very positive. Yeah. So I understand that like, you guys want to wanna launch in the first half of next year. You guys also want to be in, in space next, next year. So, so what's next then? Like, well, what's the business after that? Well, okay, for us, the business, I mean, what's next and the business? Uh, so we have two launchers uh, next year, two capsules being launched, our baby one and our teenage one. With that, we de-risk the re-entry risk, which is the highest risk. Uh, and then we'll fly the final capsule, if rain goes well, in 27. And the business is very simple. Our clients are private space stations. They are space agencies. They buy a full mission. They give us 150 million, which is very good price. Yeah. <laughs> And then we bring cargo to a station around the Earth. Around the moon, it's more expensive, 400, 50 million, 500 million, the, the mission. And then we bring back. And OK, that's step one. And afterwards, of course, we want to fly humans, uh, which is step two. And to fly humans, then we need the support of member states. Because cargo is a business that can be privately funded. Our risk rewards for human is, I believe, not something that can be privately funded. For us, it's building, building, building more rockets because ultimately our customers are actually now requesting satellite launch all the way throughout the next 10 years because they're so afraid actually they won't be able to get their hands on any rocket launch because there's a huge supply and demand imbalance right now um, and a huge scarcity of actual rocket launch. So actually a company like Amazon, um, Amazon last year bought up pretty much the whole free world's market of rocket launch for the next couple of years to launch their own satellite constellations. So they just pour in billions and billions of dollars just to secure access to space. So our goal in that case is really to keep building more rockets, um, scaling our own manufacturing capabilities um, so we can actually put out a rocket a week. And again, to put it into reference, all of Europe right now together is this year probably building maybe one rocket. And we want to build one every week. So, I mean, this year at Slash, like, I think the word AI needs to be on every, on every panel. So, does AI play a role in what, what you guys do? And if so, what? So, yes and yes. Uh, we use AI within the company, of course. Uh, we will start using Copilot next week, actually. Uh, and uh, we use AI to write, I mean, job descriptions, press releases, etc. So, let's say to increase our efficiency. And we use AI. Uh, we started using AI actually for the design of our uh, engine ourselves. Uh, we do engines which are very similar to rocket engines when we fly to the moon. Uh, and uh, for the first iteration, we did it like normally. But now we're starting to use AI actually to design the second generation of the rocket engine. So next year, when we'll test our uh, first workhorse engine, it will be an AI designed uh, engine. Again, here we actually use it also in manufacturing. So every time we, we actually 3D print our rocket engines from uh, high thermal resistance metals, 
And in the printing process, you basically build layer by layer. And it's a process that takes usually about three days to build all the components for a rocket engine. And we actually take pictures of each of those layers that we print and let the AI predict whether a print will be successful or not, such that if it actually predicts it's not going to be successful, you can already stop the print halfway, restart it, so you don't lose two days of uh, machine time. Um, that's kind of w one of the many applications we have within the company, also in manufacturing in AI. Cool. Um, do you expect, I mean, there's still like relatively few space startups in, in Europe, I, I would say. Do you expect that if you guys are successful next year, there will be sort of a Cambrian explosion and there will be lots of startups? Or is it like a niche area in the, in the startup world? So I don't think it's niche, because at the end of the day, we speak about huge businesses. I guess you will have turnover of billions. I also plan to have turnovers of billions. It's more like an infrastructure business at least for the transportation part and the, for the constellation part. It's a business where you have very few winners, because it's hard, because it's capex intensive, and I think it's a winner-takes-all business. So that's a bit how I see it. I'm not sure that we'll have dozens of thousands of you know, startups, because competence is rare. Uh, there will be very, very few succeeding, but the one who succeed, they'll be the Google, the Amazon, etc. of space. Yeah, yeah I agree. So depends on how do you define a space company. Amazon, to me, is a space company. Same okay. as is John Deere as a tractor manufacturer. As they actually, through space, want to connect every single of their million trucks across the world. And to me, they basically use space, so they're, to a certain extent, a space company. Uh, same goes for Apple or for Microsoft. They all invest billions into their own space programs. And I think space will kind of play a similar role as the internet where it's not that in a big corporation you have kind of the internet department. It's like the people who deal with the internet. But everyone is using it. Everyone is just kind of uh, integrating it into their daily life. And I think it will be very similar for space, where everyone will just use space data, whether it's about analyzing the CO2 of your supply chain, or whether it's about providing connectivity, or actually part of your own business model and your own service that you provide to your customers. I think space will just intrinsically be kind of injected into all of the different areas and levels in pretty much any company globally. It will be on every balance sheet somewhere. Great. Maybe last quick question, because we have only one and a half minutes left. Uh, so I mean, Elon Musk has the vision to, to, to die on Mars. Um, well, well, how do you see like, space in 20 years? Well, what's your big, big idea of where this is going? So I think space will have become much more accessible. Also, in, as you were mentioning, Daniel, in everyone's life. And our mission at the exploration company is to make space more cooperative and sustainable. And that's something for me very important. Um, space is part of our future. We can build it in a confrontational manner, which is nowadays happening. We can build it in a cooperative and sustainable manner. And this is at the core of our design. We start with capsule, we probably probably do other things in the future, but everything we'll do will be cooperative and sustainable. I think dying on Mars alone is a pretty sad story. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I would rather want to use space to, to really make sure that we actually manage our planet properly. And I think there's a lot more stuff that we actually need to do space for to literally manage our planet, to operate our planet, uh, other than just flying to, to Mars and beyond. I think it is a great topic because it actually also excites a lot of people to become rocket engineers and rocket scientists to actually get into the space industry. But ultimately, I think space is all about actually making sure that uh, we can live on our planet for longer than the next 10,000 years. Helen, Daniel, thanks a lot. That was great. Thank you.